Thank you very much. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here in this absolutely beautiful surroundings here in Kelvin Grove in Glasgow. And I want to welcome you all here this morning to our IPU COP26 meeting. I'm Anna McMorrin, Member of Parliament for Cardiff North in Wales. And we are all here because there is an emergency. There is a climate emergency happening around us. And I think we can all come, wherever we come from, whichever part of the world we come from, whoever we represent, we know that we have a duty to come here to call for faster, more urgent action on climate. My background is a ad climate advisor in government, but then also with the UN representing states and regions in the run-up to Paris Climate Agreement. I've been at many COPs before, but do you know this one has never felt so urgent? We hear talk, we hear conversations, we hear commitments and ambition from our governments. But what we need to see is delivery. We need to see the policies in place that are going to deliver the action that we need to see within the next few years if we are going to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. We're already on a trajectory to exceed that. So our action has to be urgent and it has to be speedy. I know that we all agree that. That's why we're here today. And that's why I welcome all of you here today. But we are all leaders wherever we come from, in our towns, in our cities, in our regions. We have a duty to go back there and really call for that urgent action. So without further ado, I'm going to begin the day. We have some fantastic speakers this morning and I'm going to introduce each one of them who will explain what they want to see and what we are calling for you to do. So first of all, I'm going to introduce the Right Honourable Sir Lindsay Hoyle, MP. Lindsay, Lindsay was elected to the position of Speaker in the House of Commons, the UK House of Commons, in November 2019. He was previously chairman of Ways and Means, responsible for overseeing the budget of any other committee of the whole house since 2010. He's been a Labour member of Parliament for Chorley and served that constituency since 1997. And prior to entering Parliament, he was a member of the Chorley Borough Council. So Sir Lindsay has huge breadth and depth of experience and it's my great pleasure to welcome Lindsay to speak here today. Can I say thank you Anna for those kind words of introduction and can I just say to the President of the IPU and of course to Harriet, thank you for the work that you do. The IPU is Im so important to us all, and it's so important that you are playing a major part in COP26. And that's so important with the number of people that's turned up today. And as I look around the countries, it is so, so impressive. But it goes without saying that we are a climate change emergency is the most pressing issue of the world today. In fact, it's something we should have had our eyes on at least 30 to 40 years ago. And I've got to say, we missed the boat then. We're now playing catch-up. Our constituents that we represent rightly expect us as parliamentarians to play an active part in doing what we can do to save the planet. Well, it is up to government to sign up to international commitments and to take key decisions. Parliament must debate the solutions. 
pass the legislative measures, allocate public funding, hold the government to account, and we must lead by example. So I'm going to outline today some of the measures that we've taken to make the UK Parliament greener and how my constituency of Chorley is playing its part. Westminster and London, where Parliament is located, has improved its air quality over recent years. Sometimes you would wonder that we haven't quite done as much as we have. But it's incumbent of us all to do our best to ensure that we are not polluting the atmosphere. While the UK is committed to being net zero carbon by 2050, we feel that as a legislation is passed, we should lead by example. So we're going to try and make sure net zero carbon on our gas and electricity use by 2035. I've got to tell you, that is a major challenge. One of the challenges we face is that Parliament is a working building which needs resources to function while trying to make it as efficient as possible. On top of that, we operate in a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which means there are lots of things that we can't do which could save energy. For instance, we have to be careful where we put solar panels on the roof to ensure they're not visible from the side or from the river. And due to the heritage restrictions that we have a challenge, we have to challenge other organisations to copy what we're trying to do. So, what have we achieved in the last 10 years? We've reduced carbon emissions by 52%. We've done this by replacing old boilers, new more efficient boilers and burners. We cooled the air in Port Cullis House during the summer by pumping water from the boiler beneath the building. And then we used the water into the flush of the loos. We're increasing the use of solar panels on the cast iron roofs. The, the Lords already have 36 installed. We in the Commons are following with 48 new panels. All electricity is 100% renewable. Non-nuclear, sources mainly wind, solar and hydroelectricity. We've replaced all our external light bulbs, including those that illuminate Big Ben, with LEDs. The most of our internal lights, including our beautiful chandeliers, are all now LED. We support the national campaigns such as Earth Hour, which means we switch off all the lights right across the estate to show our support and our awareness of the problems of climate change. We've also reduced our waste by 61%. We've moved away from single-use plastics, all our coffee cups, takeaway boxes, cutlery, soup containers, and the rest are now completely combustible. We've introduced reusable cups for sale in the catering outlets, removed plastic bottles of water for sale in pond, eliminating 120,000 bottles annually, introduced a 25p charge for consumers purchasing hot drinks served in a single-use takeaway cup, put poly poly polystyrene and plastic minimisation and packaging requirements into tenders for products related to delivery services, including furniture and IT hardware. And of course, we introduced the Green Travel Plan in 2010. This plan was introduced a decade ago. Understandably, because of COVID, few people want to use public transport and would prefer to jog, walk, cycle into work. We've got to give support for that. We've got to bike them. We've got to help them. We've got to help make the difference. Demand is now high for places to park bikes, so we're increasing the number of racks across the estate. We've even got a doctor bike in residence. Every fortnight, a bike maintenance mechanic from, for members and staff who makes sure the bikes that are stuck in the sheds are roadworthy, checks the brakes, the gears, and fixes the punches. This is all part of the encouragement. We've increased the number of showers and drying areas for wet clothes. We've installed four electric vehicle charging points and we've many more planned in Speaker's Court. Amazingly, there are an estimated 10,000 colonies of bees in central London, but not enough food sources for them. So in consultation with London Beekeepers Association, we've planted 50 pollinating friendly larva plants on the roof and more in nearby Abingdon Green to assist. Our efforts must be paying off as since at least 2008, peregrine falcons have returned to Parliament to raise their chicks. Also helps keep the pigeons down. We're investigating whether we can use the tidal flow on the River Thames besides Parliament to generate electricity. Also introducing cats on the estate rather than using poison to keep the mice population down. In fact, my cat Patrick's already there doing a great job. And I've got to say, Helen, who's the Chief of Staff in Speaker's Office wants to become the Keeper of the Cat and Head Beekeeper by Royal Appointment. 
And in my constituency, Cholliborough Council, in partnership with businesses and environmental groups, are committed to planting 116,000 trees, one for every Z resident, that will hopefully offset the carbon each of us creates and provide a habitat for wildlife, improve soil quality, improve quality of life, help stop flooding. And since 2020, we've already planted 50,000 of those trees and the rest expected before 2025. Then what we want to do is create a green forest around Chorley that will be the green lung so that we will be in the center of this wonderful forest that will give us a very, very green footprint for Chorley. Of course, we brought this process to the world stage. In fact, the G7 Speakers Conference, Chorley, when trees were planted on behalf of the seven speakers and presiding officers, including Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, along with representatives of the European Parliament. We're looking to make all our cabs in Chorley electric. We're working with a local company to make it sustainable and affordable. We're going to help the taxi drivers achieve the dream that we wish for. I've got to say, young people are the people that matter. Why does it matter to them? It's their future, it's their world. We're the ones that help destroy it. So we've got to work with them. We've got to listen to their voice. They are the voice of our future. In fact, I went to St. Lawrence's Primary School, which was the most inefficient school in Lancashire. It is now the most efficient energy-wise in Lancashire. And that's us working with the education system to try and ensure that they can have a green future. And quite rightly, the school children demanded something happen. It was a school, cold school, 60s build, usual way, flat roof, you name it. Everything you didn't want was designed into this school. Completely changed it, drone source heating, solar panels, completely state-of-the-art technology. And what a difference it's made from unhappy young people to very happy young people. Of course, we've got to do something. So let's think, what can we do? There's so much more we can do. After all, climate change is the biggest existential threat to our world. And I say to children that I visit when I visit their school, there are a future. It is their planet. We need to save it. We need to save it now. We are simply the custodians. It has to be said, until recently, we've not been a very good one. And I've got to tell you, when I work with young people and listen to young people, it's the difference they make. They are the voice of the future. And it's their voice that we've got to listen to. And I've got to say, we will see the world, and the world will talk all day. We've had COP26. We'll have some of the finest words that's been said. But words are never good enough. It will be actions that will make the difference. And when we to begin to see actions taking place, we are now know we have turned the corner. But I've got to say, the richest country as ever will have the know-how. They will have the knowledge. The problem with knowledge, it's power. And they don't like sharing power. Well, I've got to tell you, we have a duty of care because it is the poorest countries that will suffer the most. Climate change is put upon them. It is not by their choice or by their making. It is the making of the rich. And the rich has now got to stand together, not by words, as I say, by actions. So when technology change, it's not for one country to keep. It is for all of us to share that technology. If we're going to make the difference, we won't make it on our own and we mustn't make it at the expense of the poorest. We have created. It is no time for us to resolve. And as I say, as I look forward, it's not a nice vision we've got. We can make it nice. And we've all said it already. This is the last chance saloon for countries. As we see water rising, as we see drought, we see famine, we see what's happening across the world at the moment. And we have very good words. But I say, these words aren't good enough. And when we look to the wildlife of the world, something I'm so proud and passionate and believe in is the protection. It's the protection of wildlife. 50% of species will disappear within the next 30 years unless we change course. We've got to change course, not in 2050. We've got to change course from today onwards. It starts today. The revolution starts today. It's a green revolution that's going to help the poorest in the world. It is the green revolution and the financial support that's needed. So please, no more fine words. No, let's have action. Let's stick together. Make it happen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Sir Lindsay. Uh, an incredibly powerful intervention and speech. Thank you.
I'm going to move on to our second speaker, and it's with great pleasure that I welcome the Right Honourable Lord McFall of al -Kuith. I think I've got that right. Um, before entering the Lords in 2010, Lord McFall was Labour MP between 1987 and 2010, first for Dumbarton and later for West Dumbartonshire. He served as a minister in the Northern Ireland office and as a government whip. He also chaired the Treasury Select Committee and drove work to scrutinise key players, businesses during the global banking and financial crisis, making major recommendations to ensure reform. He has been named by which as consumer champion for his efforts. During his tenure as Deputy Speaker, Lord Speaker, he oversaw plans to establish new hybrid and remote ways of working during the COVID pandemic and conducted the first major review of Lord Select Committees in 25 years. As Lord Speaker, Lord McFall oversees proceedings in the Chamber. He chairs the House of Lords Commission and promotes the work of the House in the UK and abroad. So, it's without further ado, we can hear that he is a great reformer. It's my pleasure to welcome Lord McFall. Many thanks, Anna, and thank you uh, to my colleagues and Mr. Speaker in particular for his remarks. I also wish to thank the IPU and the British group, the IPU, with Harriet and her colleagues for organising this important meeting in the fantastic setting of the Kelvin Grove Museum. Now, you can probably tell from my accent that I am from around here. Indeed, I was born and raised in the west of Scotland in a town called Dumbarton, 15 miles up the north side of the Clyde. I still live there. Uh, now, and when I'm not carrying out my duties, I go back to Dumbarton. Dumbarton is about 20 minutes drive from here, or for this audience, more appropriately, it's 30 minutes travel by train, or, if you really wish, an hour and a half by bike. There is, in fact, a lovely cycle path from where we're sitting right now, through Dumbarton and Loch Lomond to the West Highland Way. So I'm proud to welcome you to this part of the world, my home, for this crucial COP26 meeting. My family and I often visit this museum. In fact, two of my grandchildren are here today with me, Grace and Luke. And Luke, Grace told me that when she was born, not far from here, the first visit her parents took her to was to this gallery. So it was very appropriate to be here today. And that reminds us of the young people. And I wish to congratulate the many thousands of young people who have turned out and walked the streets of Glasgow in the pouring rain, particularly yesterday, reminding us of our responsibility to them and to the next generation. The exhibitions that surround us now are reminders of our amazing planet and all that is at stake during our discussions. It reminds us of the artistic, natural and technological precious assets that we could lose forever. It reminds us of the cultures that could be wiped away if we don't take action. And it reminds us of the duty we have as parliamentarians in the battle against climate change. Even when the global economy shut down as a result of the pandemic, our emissions only dropped by 6%. This illustrates the enormity of the challenge ahead of us if we are to maintain the necessary pace for lasting change, if we are to achieve the 1.5% target, it requires us to achieve that 6% drop each and every year for the next 10 years. So we have to find real, radical, and alternative solutions to reduce the global temperatures 
And that's the immense challenge that we have ahead of us. As parliamentarians, we have a real responsibility. We have a duty to speak for all the people of this planet, including those whose voices are not always heard and yet are the most affected. As Pope Francis says, we have to realize that a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. This brings me on to the reason why we are gathered in this room, which is to reflect on our roles and how we individually and collectively can make a difference. As we know, COP26 only lasts two weeks. But when we depart and the cameras go away, what are the risks if the dialogue suddenly stops after that? Where then will these important conversations about the emergency that faces our planet continue? It is, of course, in our parliaments. It is in these institutions from which these issues can be debated and, more importantly, actioned through legislation. Daniel Greenberg, a parliamentary lawyer whom I know very well, captured this idea very well on BBC radio this week when he recently said, and I quote, rhetoric is not always as empty as it may appear on the surface. In government and parliament, one sees all the time how apparently endless dialogue suddenly emerges into real world change. He went on to give the example of the parliamentary debates over the Good Friday Agreement and how ultimately that dialogue directly led to peace for the people of Northern Ireland. And Anna mentioned that I had a part in the responsibility as a minister for Northern Ireland at the time. When I and my colleagues went to Northern Ireland, none of the protagonists were talking to each other. We sat in a room talking to both sides separately without them conversing with one another. At the end of the day, they did speak to one another, they did form a government and they progressed. That was a result of dialogue. That was a result of rhetoric over many, many years. So that success of the Good Friday Agreement was down to those many years of face-to-face -face engagement and dialogue, which helped to foster and repair relationships. The lesson for us here is that to achieve our agreed climate goals, our engagement must continue beyond these two weeks. And so such dialogue, the lifeblood of our parliaments, can lead to change. As Lord Speaker, I am aware that the House of Lords plays an influential role on the climate change debate in this country. I count myself fortunate to be sharing the chamber with some of the leading thinkers on climate change. The red benches of the House of Lords and the green benches of the House of Commons are well known around the world, but I would contend that the House of Lords is, in terms of our expertise and contribution in this area, impressively green. Apologies, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Let me give you just a few examples. In the House of Lords, we have our own Committee on the Environment and Climate Change set up this year and chaired by Baroness Parmenter. Its remit is to hold the government to account on issues like biodiversity and ensure that climate change action is embedded into all areas of government policy. We have in our ranks the current chairman of the Climate Change Committee, Lord Deben, as well as having the peers for the Planet Group, chaired by Baroness Heyman, who do excellent work. Both Lord Stern and the Astronomer Royal Lord Rees of Lundo are renowned globally for their work on climate change and related fields. And Lord Rees, himself not a Catholic, was very influential 
in the consultations which Pope Francis undertook when he produced his encyclical Laudati Si in 2015. When the Environment Bill comes back to the Lords next week, we will see the Green Peer Baroness, Baroness Jones of Moolscombe, fighting for local support to our transition to a zero carbon economy. We will witness the Duke of Wellington continuing his campaign for sewage-free rivers. And we'll see Baroness Heyman of Willock fighting for cleaner air. These examples are just a few to demonstrate that the House of Lords is a place of dialogue, scrutiny, and concrete action. In this work, the Lords complements the Commons by proposing amendments to legislation, many of which are accepted by the government. Our House is replete with subject-based experts who ensure that our, Lords, our laws stand the test of time. So I want to end by thanking you again for your participation and most importantly, for your future action and commitment. Let's never forget the crucial role that parliaments will play in the conversation on climate change long after COP26 has ended and we have departed Glasgow. And I hope that when my grandchildren sitting just here return to this museum in years to come, they know that their grandfather and you, my colleagues, chose to do the right thing for our planet using the important parliamentary platform we have been given. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a very powerful speech there uh, from the Lord's representative. Fantastic, thank you. Our third speaker today was elected, I'm very proud to have him here today, elected as president of the IPU in 2020. Mr. Duarte Pacheco has been a member of parliament in Portugal since 1991. He's held many roles, member of the Budget and Finance Committee, Committee on Foreign Affairs and the Portuguese Communities, and at the IPU, Mr. Pacheco has been a member of the Portuguese delegation since 2002, and its head since 2016. He was the chair of the IPU's 12-plus geopolitical group for three years, and also the vice president of the IPU's Standing Committee on Peace and International Security. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Pacheco to give an overview of the IPU's climate work and also look at the IPU's five-year strategy. Welcome. Honourable Speaker of the House of Commons, Honourable Lord Speaker of the House of Lord, Lords, Madam Chair of the British Geo uh, Geopolitical Group to the IPU, dear colleagues and friends, on behalf of the IPU, I am honoured to welcome you to the parliamentary meeting organised in connection to the COP26, jointly with the British group of IPU. And of course, my first words should be to the, our colleagues from the British Parliament. Thank you so much for the organization of this meeting and for all the efforts to achieve the success and the participation of so many colleagues around the world, not just at COP itself, but here in this parliamentary hearing of uh, COP26. Thank you so much for all your efforts. Dear colleagues, we are here today after the successful of the PREPCOM26 parliamentary meeting organized last month in Rome, jointly with the Italian parliamentary parliament that set the floor for a fruitful dialogue 
parliamentary commitment and cooperation in climate action. Rome sent to all of us a vision of a world that is greener and more equal than the one we live in right now. This vision is expressed in the draft outcome document that you will be invited to adopt at the end of this meeting. As parliamentarians, we have the power to turn this vision into reality. And believe me, this is the most important point of our meeting. How to transform words into real action. Dear colleagues, I will ask you something. Are you available to destroy your own? Are you available to destroy the place where you live? Where you live with your families? Where you receive your friends? I believe you don't. So, why are we available to this destroy our common home, our planet. It's the same. And we need to think this way. Science has spoken loud and clear, and the clock is ticking. Irreversible change is happening, is underway. And again, action needs to be taken to avoid a catastrophe. That's why we are here in Glasgow. We came not just to see each other. Of course, we like to see each other. But we came because we know there is a problem and we have responsibilities to solve the problem. COP26 is an op one opportunity not to be missed in the fight of climate change. And it must uh, deliver in providing solutions from a global <clears throat> and a long-term perspective, including addressing the issue of financing for both adaptation and mitigation. It is the last, the last believe, the last chance to hold countries accountable to the Paris Agreement and to set concrete plans to reach defined targets moving forward. The IPU, together with member parliaments, has long supported parliamentary dimension of climate negotiations. There are silver linings. We can face the planetary crisis with immediate action and strong political leadership. COP26 can be a success if we have a plan for action, but it, it requires all full implementation. The role of parliamentarians, so your role, our role, because I am a parliamentarian too, in this respect is crucial. Parliaments can act as agents of change and make a turn in climate action now, supporting the translation of the commitments made under the Paris Agreement into national level action. Parliamentary engagement in providing coherent national legislative response to the COVID pandemic show to all of us that when we want, we achieve what is needed. It's the same with climate change. As the members of the representative body, parliaments and parliamentarians, as a unique position to lead towards the decarbonization and sustainability in the post-pandemic times, and transform the climate commitments into realities on the ground. But please, I will ask you something. During all this week, we must use our capacity to make our governments to get one agreement, or better, 
one agreement that needs to be adopted to the reality with concrete steps and targets to be achieved. And after it, when we return home, we must assume that words will not be just words. It is time for action. That's why, dear colleagues, I thank you for your commitment on this, and I look forward to have your leadership, to have a real sustainable world. This is what we need. It's time to action. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to our president for a, a, a very good, strong speech there. I'm going to move on quickly to our fourth speaker, Harriet Baldwin, Member of Parliament for West Worcestershire. She's been a member of the Treasury Committee and Finance Committee. She's also been a Minister of State for Africa, a Minister of State for the Department of International Development, a Government Whip, Economic Secretary to the Treasury, and Parliamentary Undersecretary to the Ministry of Defence. She is now Chair of the International Parliamentary Network for Education and was elected Chair of the British Group of the IPU in March 2020. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Harriet to speak. Thank you so much, Anna, for those kind words of introduction. And Lord Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. President of the IPU, Mr. Secretary General, fellow parliamentarians from around the world, I welcome you on behalf of the British group of the IPU here to Glasgow to COP26. Thank you all for traveling so far to join us all today uh, in this event. And I also want to put on record my thanks to our small team at the BGIPU for all the hard work that has gone into organizing uh, this event. As you heard in the introduction, I'm a member of parliament and I represent the beautiful constituency of West Worcestershire and all of us here today are here because we play a crucial role in the success of this global agenda. All of us here today are here because without us we cannot achieve what the world wants to achieve in terms of preserving our precious planet. All of us are here today because as parliamentarians, we are given a voice. Thanks to our speakers who allow us to speak in our parliaments, we have that voice and we are able to put on record what we think needs to happen. But also because we are member of parliament, we represent all those who feel Voiceless. I am sure that you also, as parliamentarians, saw the number of people demonstrating worldwide yesterday. These are people who sometimes feel voiceless. We are their representatives. We have to articulate their voice. And I'm sure, like me, you also go and do a lot of visits to schools to, vi to visit those who are still too young to vote and we hear those powerful young voices in terms of wanting to make changes to preserve the planet for their future. And so as parliamentarians, we're not only the voice, but we're the representatives of those other voices. But also, very, very crucially, we are involved in the legislation. We have the negotiators from all our governments working on the text but it will be down to us to legislate that text. And I'm proud that the UK Parliament was one of the very first developed economies to put net zero into 
law. It was something that was done with cross-party agreement in our parliament. And I'm also proud that under the UK presidency of COP, the number of economies that have adopted a net zero stance has moved from 30% of the world economy up to 90% of the world economy this week. We're also, as parliamentarians, absolutely key in terms of scrutinizing that legislation. And I know that a number of you here today are from the scrutiny committees that really hold their government's feet to the fire in terms of those commitments. I also know that we are at a crucial stage in terms of the negotiations at this COP. We heard today from uh, the UK Prime Minister that bold compromises are going to be needed during this second week of negotiations. And I ask all of you as parliamentarians to urge your negotiators to be willing to make those bold compromises. The key objectives of uh, the UK uh, uh, in its role as co-presidency of this COP are that all countries sign up to ambitious nationally determined contributions, that all countries commit to reach uh, net zero emissions, get that 90% to 100%, and that all developed countries who can afford to put money into climate finance, this will be the wisest investment that you ever make. It is something that will pay off and reward that investment many, many times. And we must all make sure, those of us who come from the richer developed nations, that we urge our governments to do more in terms of climate finance. I was very excited on today, uh, on Wednesday's uh, finance day to hear that now 130 trillion dollars, a number that is just something I cannot even get my head around, is now committed to invest in companies that are on a path to net zero. And we need that private sector change to drive this agenda forward. And we need an ambitious agreement this week uh, of a package of measures that will take forward uh, the Paris Agreement. So thank you, all the parliamentarians who are here today. Thank you for traveling so far to be that voice, to be that representative, to be that legislator, to be that scrutineer. We have a very powerful agenda for you today, an agenda where you will hear from experts, an agenda where you will hear the questions that you need to be asking in your parliaments. We will not, unfortunately, be able to hear from our COP president. He is so involved in the negotiations today and the UK top negotiator that they've had to send apologies for this event. But that means that we need to redouble our efforts, to redouble our role as the voice, the representative, the legislators and the scrutineers. And I hope that today's agenda, today's inspirational speakers, will strengthen your commitment to driving this agenda through in your parliaments. And I thank you all for being here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Harriet. Uh, really good to hear from you to wrap up and in terms of what the British group of the IPU are doing. And I want to just pay tribute and thank our speakers here this morning. Mr. Speaker, Lord Speaker, our President of the IPU and our Chair of the British group of I the IPU here uh, in the UK. All of you have a part to play, as we've heard. And it is up to us now. There is a political consensus. There is ambition. But we need to go back to our own parliaments, our own areas of the world, as leaders in our own parts, and drive forward that change. We only have a few years to act. If we don't act within the next decade, we will see runaway climate change. And we know it is the most vulnerable, the poorest who pay that price. It is up to us, it is up to the richest countries to help those poorest. Only yesterday, I was speaking to representatives 
from the, Amazon, from the Amazonian area, indigenous people struggling to protect their land, guardians of their land for 7,000 years. We need to be helping these people, whether it's in the Amazon, whether it's in the Philippines, in Uganda, wherever it is in the world. I know in my constituency of Cardiff North, I have people who when it rains, a torrential rain at night, they sleep with their furniture upstairs. They take it in turns to walk to see the level of the river nearby. That is no way to live and we know that people are suffering much, much worse with climate refugees increasing year in, year out. So I welcome you here today and I thank our speakers here this morning. I'm sad that our COP president from the UK government has had a lie-in this morning instead of coming to address you, but I hope that he will take the message here today that we want to see leadership from this UK government who are chairing COP and that Glasgow is not the end but just the beginning of the action that we need to see within this decade. Thank you. And I think now we have our next, thank you to the speakers, we have our next session before you're able to go off and have some coffee, which I know you're all desperate for. I'm going to get our next speaker up here. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our next speaker, the Honourable Senator Rosa Galvez, originally from Peru, is one of Canada's leading experts in pollution control and its effects on human health. With a PhD in environmental engineering, she's been a professor at the Université Laval à Québec since 1994, heading the Civil and Water Engineering Department. Throughout her career, she has acted as an expert for national and international agencies, such as the Commission of Environmental Cooperation, the British Research Council, and the UNESCO Mediterranean Water Network. She advised a number of international organizations as well on the Canada, US, and Quebec Vermont agreements on the protection of the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River, she also conducted an incredibly important study on the catastrophic oil spill at Lac Megantique in Quebec. Senator Galvez was appointed to the Senate of Canada on uh, in December 2016. In June 2021, she was elected president of Pal America's Parliamentary Network on Climate Change. I know from having worked across many states and regions through this COP process in delivering action, the work that Quebec has done in driving forward climate action. So it is my great pleasure to introduce the Honourable Senator Rosa Galvez. Thank you. Good morning, my dear fellow parliamentarians. Canada just had an election, and before, and it was the second within the COVID. I wrote an op-ed that it was called Bring Government Back Better. Throughout these horrible times of pandemic, one truth resonated through all these four waves of COVID-19 that COVID-19 did not break the system. 
it exposed a broken system. Indeed, we need democracy back, stronger, wiser, and more open to new ideas with all of its decisions covered by checks and balances that needs to be restored. Thank you so much to the IPU and the British branch to invite me into this historical venue and to have this time to talk to you. Honorable guests, it is with great pressure that I participate in this IPU parliamentary meeting to discuss our role as parliamentarians in the fight against climate change. We will be the ones holding governments accountable, ensuring that they act decisively to reach our goals and advocating for more ambitious plan. Today, I would like to offer my insights on the incredible and transformative opportunity we have across the world to reshape our economies by aligning them with our climate commitments. Several months into the COVID-19 pandemic, it became clear for many of us, governments around all over the world, especially in the developed country, that we had to inject unprecedented amount of money to support its citizens and to recover from the socioeconomic crisis provoked that lockdown. Isn't it interesting to say that when our economy was consumers were buying just basic needs products, our economy went down and that threats of inflation and depression loom in the sky? What does it that tell about our economy that is based on buying stuff that is not basic. These lockdown conditions have taken a disproportional toll on lower income individuals, the elderly, and groups who already bear a degree of structural oppression. Further, the pandemic has revealed a system where we exploit the finite natural resources of our planet with the illogical expectation of infinite growth. Yesterday, I heard, instead of using GDP, we should think and create a green DP. And governments subsidize environmental behavior through support of polluting industries and corporations. There are so many reasons because I'm proud to be Canadian and proud to be from Quebec that just declared that we are going to leave our natural oil resources in the ground. But at the same time, Canada is in the top of the G7 countries giving and providing subsidies to the oil and gas. The IPCC has said unequivocally that is the human activities. I just wish they would say too that is CO2 and that, that sources of that CO2 and methane are oil, gas, and coal. Unbridled economic growth is the root cause of ecological destabilization. As stimulus began to flow, I started reflecting on the ultimate goal and the most efficient way to achieve it. These reflections led to the publication of a white paper entitled Building Forward Better, a clean and just recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, publicly available in three languages at my website. It draws inspiration from various organizations, including here from Oxford in the UK, advocating for holistic approach to rebuilding Canadian society to achieve greater and overall collective well-being by proposing specific public policies in great detail. It also addressed the funding of a clean recovery, where and how the funds can be recouped and included that set of core policy recommendations. Although this white paper is focused, of course, on the Canadian experience, these proposed policies, and because of I also wear the hat of Parliament as president of the Network on Climate Change, there are many of these policies that can be applied also to developing countries. And you will find the principles in which they are based and how they can be applicable across the world. 
A clean and just recovery is one that puts people before and focus on furthering and eventually achieving human and ecosystem well-being. We need an indicator of well-being and use it in when we discuss our budgets. GDP doesn't take in consideration many things. In Canada, the governor of the Bank of Canada before, uh, after Mark Carney, he told me, Senator Galvez, do you know that GDP in Canada doesn't take in consideration our aging population and that there is a big fraction of our Canadian population taking their pensions and that this will destabilize our economy? Where are, who's going to pay these retirement plans? So I challenge him to think about another indicators that will reflect better what is the state of our economy. Such a goal implies the development of principles and tools that not only ensure the costs and benefits of the recovery and that are distributed equitably, but also help shift our concept of growth to be centered around sustainable prosperity. There are many names. I know we cannot be blocked and find obstacles in defining the name. It's the concept. We want to think in more than short-termism. Term in Canada, indigenous people think in terms of seven generations. My grandparents in the Andes, in the jungle, or in the Amazon, always thought in three generations. After all, the economy must serve society, not the other way around. Also, we can change our socioeconomic models, but we cannot change the planetary laws. We cannot change gravity. So we have to change what we can change, which is our socioeconomic models. Traditional stimulus measures often have a poor governance and transparency track record, unfortunately. Looking forward, we must worry about reinforcing a status quo of keep with investment into soon to be stranded assets. We know that banks and finances and governments and crown corporations and government organizations are still financing oil and gas. We are already, we are already very worried about the stranded assets and, and the environmental passives of many of these oil uh, ex, um, extractions. So this is unnecessary exposure to financial risk, and it increases inequality. All policies must be scrutinized through gender, social justice, and climate lenses, which must be rapidly developed and implemented as well as carry a strict measure for accountability and transparency. With the wave of environmental protest, I am here, this is the second week I'm here, and I know that there is a, an official COP 26 going on in, in these venues, but there is also an unofficial COP going on in the streets of Glasgow. And I was walking one night and I heard so many language. This is not only British people, Scottish people walking. I, I heard many language, Portuguese, Spanish, German. So we have to hear their discontent with current climate action and their plea to transition to a low carbon economy. In fact, you know, for us to call a transition, it should have had a, a beginning and an end, and it'd be very short. We passed that. We passed 30 years, we are talking about transition. What we need now is a transformation. In fact, due to inaction and delay, which has hampered in this transition for the past three decades, we now need a rapid and far-reaching transformation. Several positive announcements in this week of COP26 are encouraging. Yes, including my fellow Canadian, Mr. Carney, the UN Special Envoy on Climate Action and Finance announcement of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero committed of over 130 trillion of private capital to transform the economy towards net zero, and that 20 
countries, including Canada, promised that they will shift public finances away from fossil fuels before the end of 2022. In recent speeches, Mr. Mark Carney has said that it is now the time to start fiddling with the wonky plumbing of the financial world if we are to succeed in this transformation. I could not agree more. After decades, decades of international discussion about climate change and promotion of voluntary actions, the financial and private investment sector is still massively supporting high emitting polluters, putting barriers into our race, this healthy race that we need to hold to reach net zero before 2050. This must change, and we legislators have the power to act and to do this transformation. Despite ever-expanding data and climate risk disclosure just aren't enough. Legal and commercial incentives for business and investi in investors to act. Listen to this, in November 2020, the Financial Times reported that an HSBC survey of 2,000 investors found that just only 10% view the climate disclosure as a relevant source of information. The story quoted Carsten Jung, a former Bank of England economist who worked on climate disclosure rule, and he said, and I quote, many firms may discuss risk and do exactly nothing to advance the transition. In other words, don't expect climate-related financial disclosure to result in the real-world changes that we need. Unfortunately, too many of the largest investors still operate under the interpretation that fiduciary duties where social and environmental issues can be considered only if they reduce financial risk or increase financial return in measurable ways. Banks, which are a critical influential actors in any economy, currently have no regulatory or commercial incentive to lead the way and reduce the carbon footprint of their loan portfolios. Then, legislative action is necessary and essential to provoke the change and transformation that we desperately need. We must require that financial activities align with and support achieving climate commitments. We must make banks, capital reserve requirements and pensions funding requirements as a direct function of the carbon exposure of their portfolios. We must specify that fiduciary duties of corporate directors, pension plan administrators, and other fiduciaries require that their investment align with climate commitments and specific plans in that regard. Aligning finance with climate committees must start with national public finances, and there, there is where we act, namely with CRAN and government-owned corporations by eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. We cannot progress and then come back, progress and then come back at this time. We cannot with one hand finance pipelines and still giving subsidies, and on the other hand say we need to go into renewable energy. We have to have bold a strong and clear message. Nations must lead by example. The world needs more leaders that will tackle both risk with equal pressure, protecting, yes, the financial institution from increasing, increasing climate-related risk, but also at the same time, protecting humans and our only dear planet Earth A, there's no planet B, from irresponsible financial decisions. I hope you are with me and that we will work together. I am in Canada and my office will be always open to discuss further any of these subjects that I brought for you today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Senator Rosa Galvez showing how we must have bold, strong action, looking at finance, a clean and just recovery, 
and importantly, an indicator of well-being. And I just want to slightly abuse my position here as a Welsh MP to say please come and speak to the Welsh Government on our groundbreaking Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which puts a long-term duty of sustainability on all public bodies and decision-making in government. Now, we're on to the coffee, but first of all, we're going to get together for a group photograph, and then you have a 20-minute break. The cafeteria is downstairs serving coffee. I want to thank all the speakers this morning and for you here today listening. Thank you.